Hi everyone. My name's Michael Sean Fletcher. I'm from the University of Melbourne. I'm a geographer. I'm a Wiradjuri man. Welcome to Always Was, Always Will Be, Land, Water and Fire, the Science of a Continuing Culture, Continuous Culture. I'd first like to acknowledge country. I'm on the lands of the Wurundjeri on the campus of the University of Melbourne, the central campus. The University of Melbourne has uh, campuses on Jaja Wurrung country, Yorta Yorta country, Boon Wurrung and Bunurong country. So I'd like to pay my respects to elders past and present of the Wurundjeri and all the mobs in which University of Melbourne has a footprint on and indeed all the mobs from wherever you are today. I'd like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and recognise that we're all standing on lands that were never ceded. These are Aboriginal lands uh, created and maintained by Aboriginal people for more than 65,000 years. So we're here for NAIDOC week. So NAIDOC week uh, celebrations are held across Australia to in each July. Okay, it's been delayed this time because we hoped uh, we'd be able to do things face to face, but this is the COVID world. We're now hitting COVID normal. Um, to celebrate history, culture and achievements of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. NAIDOC is celebrated not only in Indigenous communities by Australians from all walks of life. And the week is a great opportunity to participate in a range of activities to support your local Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community. So I urge you to get online and have a look at what the, your local mob is doing through NAIDOC and support them. And for me, I think I, NAIDOC for me is a very special week. I think the two big ones throughout the year are National Reconciliation Week and NAIDOC Week. This one for, for me is, is sort of our week. So we get to celebrate ourselves. I see National Reconciliation Week as one really where our non-Indigenous brothers and sisters should really carry the burden about the, the path to reconciliation. So I'm really happy to be here today. Uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have lived and nurtured a connection to country within Australia for more than 65,000 years. We've observed significant changes in country. We arrived during a, a glacial cycle, an ice age, witnessed varying changes in our environment, such as the exit out of the last ice age into what we consider the interglacial or the period we're living in now, a massive period of climate change and global warming which our people managed country through, looking to the seasons, climate, land, water, sky, to build an intricate knowledge of the world around us, country. And country to us is not only the environment, but it's us. And by keeping country healthy, we keep ourselves healthy. This is one of the founding uh, philosophies, if you like, for caring for country or looking after country of Aboriginal people. And in our time here, we've developed really sophisticated ways of managing country, of knowing country, of using fire, water, procuring foods and medicine, all from this amazing continent we live on, Australia. So the overall aim of this event is really to discuss and assert the role or what our knowledge is and how that uh, matches or connects with this thing we call science. Okay, so science in itself that's practiced, say, in the Academy of Sciences and what most people think of science is essentially a Renaissance post-Enlightenment endeavour, which I would argue one of the fundamental principles in this endeavour is a, a dualism between nature and culture. Okay, it's this abstraction of humanity from the world around and the division of it into tiny infinite particles and, and concepts and studying them in isolation and understanding the rules that govern them. But more broadly, science is essentially the endeavour of observing, experimenting and predicting and doing this over and over again and learning through observations, experimenting from those observations predicting what the outcome will be and applying that into the next scientific experiment. This is a, an endeavor, a process that all humans undertake and all humans have undertaken through time. So it's nothing unique to any particular culture. 
It is something that is ubiquitously human. So to explore the nexus between indigenous knowledge and practice and science, I'm joined by two people I regard as important indigenous knowledge holders and excellent sciences in the uh, tradition of the academy that we are in coming through today, the Academy of Science. First, I have Brad Mogridge, who's a proud Murray from the Kamuroi Nation and works as an Associate Professor in Indigenous Water Science at the Centre of Applied Water Science at the University of Canberra, building research around the incorporation of Indigenous knowledge into water science. Bradley is also a PhD candidate at University of Canberra with qualifications in hydrology and environmental science and has focused on Indigenous water values and knowledge for 25 years. Hey, Brad. Hey, Yama. I'd also like to introduce Zena Cumston, a Barkindji woman currently working as a research fellow for the Clean Air Urban Landscapes Hub at the University of Melbourne, funded by the Australian Government's National Environment Science Program. Zena's research centres around Aboriginal perspectives of biodiversity in urban areas. She recently released a free ebook, which I implore you to go and have a look at, exploring Aboriginal plant use. About myself, as I said, I'm a Wiradjuri man. I'm based at the University of Melbourne in the School of Geography. Uh, my main focus is the long-term dynamic between people, landscapes, uh, and climate at both at local, regional, and global scales. And I've worked across the Southern Hemisphere, reconstructing environmental change over the last million years, right up through to present. Uh, to kick off, I'd just like to start off with maybe a little personal mm -hmm. anecdote, Brad, and then Zena. Can you tell us a little bit about your pathway toward science and what inspired you, what drives you, and what you do? I'll go first. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah look, thanks, Michael. And uh, look, I'm on Ngunnawal country and knowledge their lands. I'm, I'm actually in the Shine Dome at the Academy of Science, which is cool. So it's, um, I'm in the, the, the home of science in the Australian context. But for me, science, look, I, and especially water science, I started getting interested in that about 65,000 years ago. Um, I know my kids, they're not going to be laughing at that one. That's my old favourite. <laughs> um, yeah, it's been a long time. And um, yeah, I soon realised that water was a key part of who we are and realizing that australia being the driest inhabited continent on earth and we have this old knowledge system that is not having its say in in the way we look after water and i suppose my my journey has been through the sciences and enjoyed science i was told i'd never be good at science and maths going into year 11 and i thought bugger that i'm going to do it because i love it and i thought i can ask questions and then i can answer those questions and then, you know, as you mentioned, Michael, we can replicate it. So um, on that journey through uh, physical science, so geology, and then um, environmental science, and then later hydrogeology. Oh, yeah, Michael, I'm a hydrogeologist, not a hydrologist. Don't mix me up with those surface water mob. <laughs> <laughs> and, well, I'm not again. <laughs> and, you know, that, that, that part where I could see the opportunities because of, I, I you could see that water was always going to be an issue in Australia, um, being such a dry and so so much variability. And we move in a climate um, climate change world, and water is going to be at the key of what we do and and how we survive. And I think celebrating the knowledge of Indigenous people across the country in water is, is my main goal now. So yeah, that's sort of where I found myself. Yeah, nice one. Uh, you, Zena, you want to give us a bit of an account about how you got here? Yeah, well, I probably shouldn't be here because I'm arts through and through. Um, I didn't do very well at school, but um, I did well in drama and English and history. And I went on to become an actor and I was an actor for 10 years. Um, and then I went back to uni when I was in my mid-30s um, to do archaeology. And um, I kind of got carried away with storytelling again. And um, so whilst I did a lot of archaeology subjects, um, <clears throat> I ended up... Uh, wanting more to tell the stories of our people, maybe not through the lens of that sort of scientific realm. I've been working as a researcher for about the last 10 years um, and I actually came to my job in science as a complete accident about two years ago. 
So yet again, I've snuck in through the side door, but um, I am really loving being a part of this world and all the things that I am learning and the amazing people who are so accomplished and, um, you know, have incredible knowledge like the two of you that I get to hang around with as a um, person who's snuck in. And I guess it's good for me to have come as a newcomer in some ways because um, in all of the work that I've done since I left school, it's all of it's got a through line of storytelling in some way. And I really love to tell the stories of the way that we, um, you know, our mobs interact with country. And I feel like because I see science with new eyes, it's really helped me in that science communication realm because um, I guess because I'm coming to it as a newcomer, it's easy for me to invite others to come along with us. So, yeah, I'm really obsessed with plants and that's kind of how I got this job. Um, it's probably a too long a story to tell now, but I feel very honoured to have been in the right place at the right time because I'm getting paid to learn. That's that's an amazing thing. Yeah, great. Now, I think that's a really important point you touch upon, Zena. And what I sort of mentioned before about, about knowledge and, and science, uh, Indigenous knowledge and science, you know, I, working in the, in the historical sense, I've come across dreaming stories and, and stories that they've got information hardwired in them that can only be dated to the last ice age, 21,000 years ago. You know, they can only be. I know of no written account in any other tradition that has hardwired knowledge in it that that's old, that, that, old, that is that old. So the fact that you come from what you might call an art space or a humanities base and, and storytelling is so fundamental to the, the way that our knowledge is expressed. And I think knowledge full stop is expressed. I think it's um, something that's, that's often forgotten my own pathway, and I'll pick up on that in a minute, my own pathway is I was just a kid who loved the bush. Um, you know, used to get my hands dirty all the time, doing all sorts of things in the bush, and I always wanted to be a wildlife cinematographer, you know, go out there and take photos of, of, of animals and plants and things like this. Um, and, yeah, I, I went to university, studied to be a teacher and, and did these geography subjects that really sort of turned my mind on to the how well things are interconnected and how that really reflected what Indigenous knowledge was. It's not splitting away. It's not just about water. It's not just about plants. It's not just about fire. You know, it's about all of that together and people. And I think it's a really important uh, point, that a really important journey that you've taken, Zena, in, into science. It, it, it's equipped you to be, I think, a, a very robust scientist, and it's a really good thing. So this sort of segues into... Well, understanding what do we feel, I'd like to throw this out to you two and whoever wants to answer it, what do we feel the main barrier is preventing the recognition of our knowledge as science? Brad, do you want to go first? Yeah, happy to. Um, thanks, Zena. Yeah, look, I, I think there's a number of barriers. I think the culture of science needs to change. Um, it needs to be more flexible in the way it perceives itself and that's that's on the academies as well um, our knowledge per se is not celebrated it's not you know it's only just starting to find its way into to curricula um, the indigenization of the curricula um, and then I think that can move into the indigenization of science and I think that is one place where it's taught from you know preschool all the way into university. And then that way, people will start to realise that we're not wandering, wandering aimlessly around um, as noble savages, you know, as, as first portrayed, so they could actually acquire this, this continent. So, you know, we, we really need to take, take, take the microphones as well, you know, and fill that space, fill that void, and be the ones, you know, as Zena was saying, telling our stories our way. You know, you know I think that's really cool because scientists are not known for being good communicators. Um, and, you know, potentially I'm trying to break the mould is, is using stories to tell um, that those thousands of years of observation and testing the country, as you mentioned, Michael, too, that, you know, we are the first scientists. We were doing science before science was a thing. You know, so we, you know, that there's so many examples of that and they're starting to pop up um, more and more. And, you know, I, I don't like the word va validated, but, you know, it's 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 making our knowledge respect you know it needs to be respected for what it is and then obviously the culture of science needs to change to to accept it into its academy and you know we're on an equal playing field but we're we're not there yet yeah it's a really good point like 
I'd say the the validation you speak of, I see mm. around us in the in the last few years. You know, mm. with, we're talking offline. I'd like you to explore this this for us a bit, Brad. You know, there were thousands upon thousands of fish that suddenly died in the Murray Darling system. Mm. We had the largest catastrophic wildfires that Australia's ever seen. We've recorded nothing like it in the geological record. You know, these these are events that are that began and have uh, can be directly linked. We have the fastest rate of biodiversity loss on Earth. You know, that can directly linked to pulling mob off country and not respecting that our knowledge in our way were the right ways for this country and that were in scientific endeavours, our land management practices and our science. Mm. And I think that that for me is pretty stark validation that our knowledge is is every little bit as important, if not more, than the sort of scientific approaches that people approach land management with today. Mm. Zena, have you got any thoughts on in, in your sort of field? What are some of the barriers to to our science and our knowledge being recognised for what it is? Um, I think that fundamentally we have uh, a very different worldview, and also through you know the ongoing effects of colonisation, we from the start have been kept very separate in many ways, and that continued on when you think of um, Aboriginal people being pushed to the outskirts of town. We've always kind of been put on the outside. And I really see that um, it's just it's a problem of of the ongoing effects of colonisation, which is not something that happened in the past. It's a structure that continues today, and continues to lock us out of really important um, levels of management and dialogue that would see us in the driver's seat, as um, Victor Stephenson put in his book. We're so often in the back seat. It'd be really wonderful to drive one day, but I guess fundamentally, there's not only that separation that I see as a massive impediment that continues in ways that we don't even um, often see through our structures. Um, I think there's also, unfortunately, still an assumed superiority. And that's, again, something that people don't realise that they are trucking with. Um, and it really has to be unpacked for people, which is why uh, I think it's so important as we're wanting to Indigenise curricula and we're wanting to include more Aboriginal and or Torres Strait Islander people in science and the work that we're doing that we really, really need to look at the past and what's happened in the past. Because what we're doing is we're relationship building when we've been apart from each other and estranged from each other for such a long time. If we were in a relationship, we wouldn't just get together and think, oh, we'll just forget about all that stuff. We'd work together to talk about what happened, who was at fault and how we might be able to, to um, you know, broach the chasm that has happened between us. It's all about relationship building. And so, yeah, I see truth telling and the fact that we haven't really had it in this country in any significant way. And we certainly don't have it in science faculties where people who are teaching science even understand the trajectory of their own, um, the system that they're within and the damage that's caused over time. Um, so, yeah, I think, unfortunately, it's the assumed superiority problem that we don't even realise is there. Um, that a lot of the time locks out Aboriginal ways of seeing and doing um, and, uh, you know, the huge um, knowledge base that we have. Um, I think we're still sometimes seen as in many ways inferior, unfortunately. And it was science yeah. that started those dialogues. Mm. Yeah, you're, you're spot on, you know, and I, I think really the world's starting to wake up or at least Australia's starting to wake up and I know that they are in, in the US as well about the role of of traditional knowledge in wrestling some of these huge challenges we're facing now. like And I think the fires were the most obvious one in 2019, 2020, which my research directly pins to the removal of cultural burning from country 250 years ago. You know, like you can, you can track the accumulation of fuels. These bushfires began then. They're being accelerated by climate change. Yet our knowledge and the fact that we are capable of, of such a radical thing like, uh, you know, can, keeping this country under in a radically different way than it that it was that it is now, like a, as an open country, healthy, we weren't given that uh, that agency or, or given the credit that we could do that. And this is all across all across the, in the Maori in New Zealand, in the way they transformed country with fire. And for for years, it was they, it was considered they couldn't have done it. Not until you know, a really smart guy with his computer rocked up and modelled that, hey, actually, it's pretty easy. You know what you need to be? You need to be smart. You need to be intelligent and wear your burn. 
And this is for too long, I think scientific models have abstracted us and our knowledge out of systems and forgotten that we were actually in this country and, and built this country and created this country. So another one, I think of one of these catastrophes, and I think everyone hopefully hasn't forgotten, but it might be overshadowed by the 2019, 2020 fires and, um, and the COVID crisis, which has rolled through, was the, the fish deaths, Brad. Are you able to unpack a little bit about that and some of the factors and, and how our knowledge rolls into that? Yeah, thanks, Michael. Yeah, that was a, a horrific time. And I suppose it was quite unfortunate for, for uh, well, Indigenous people that were trying to get their voice heard through that. And, you know, then we had the, the fires, which soon overtook that. And then obviously COVID took over all of it. Um, but I think really, when you look back at that, there was a lot of a lot of the mob out on country said, look, I told you so, it was going to happen. It was always going to happen. When you start over extracting a system, when you start taking water that is supposed to keep the rivers alive, the one that is the low flow, that will fill, you know, replenish some of those deep water holes where the fish, the, the native fish are trying to survive. Um, if you start taking that water away, you're going to have catastrophic outcomes. And what we saw was that, you know, was that the rivers dried up, they stopped flowing, and some of those water holes started drying up. And then obviously blue-green algal blooms kicked in because of the, the high nutrients and also the, the, the temperatures um, increasing. And, um, and I think that was a was a key and then what we saw was two independent scientific panels one was run by the opposition then and they they would come through the academy of science and the other one was run through the the government of, um and it was run through mdba and uh for the minister and you know those two science panels looked at what what happened why it happened what are the issues and it was lucky for them that science come through and spoke spoke um in a similar language but the language that was missing was an indigenous voice and you know that those those fish those big old fish were people's totems they were also people's food source they were people had a spiritual uh, physical and cultural connection to those those fish species you know the big cod um the big yellow bellies and you know the the black fish and things like that were just floating belly up and that voice wasn't really come through and you know those two independent science panels did not have an Aboriginal person on there. And, you know, when you look at what happened after, you know, we had Uncle Badger talking about, you know, his country and the, the impacts on, on his river, his Barker. Um, and, you know, that's that's your country, Zena, and thanks for letting me talk about it. But it's it's a to see the the, the sadness on their faces was 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 heartbreaking. And and you know, there, you know, I, I look at Uncle Badger's submission to the Royal Commission in um, to the Murray Darling in South Australia. And that was, um, that's the exhibit A. You know, you could say, look, there, he told you so. You know, all the things that were happening, he, he said was, were gonna happen. And, you know, he, his knowledge is not seen as science. And unfortunately, you know, hopefully we learn from that. And then, you know, we saw with the fire stuff, we had um, Aboriginal people on, on some of those expert panels. But I think for water, you know, and, and, and the way we manage country, we're still sort of lagging behind. So. Yeah, look, it's it's a little frustrating, but I think it's um, hopefully we can learn from that. Mm. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, considering how important water is on this continent. It's mm. amazing that we're ignoring it. Yeah. You know, and there are there are clear examples of immense uh, hydro engineering mm. performed by Aboriginal people right mm. across the landscape, yep. not just down at Butch Bim, yep. right across the Australian landscape. Mm. Aboriginal people were modifying country. They were also, but at the time of the invasion, cultivating mm. and performing sophisticated agriculture. So, Zena, do you want to talk to us? I, I note that you know we in Australia rely on the big four grains, and there's a whole lot of scientific endeavour that goes into to making those big four grains. You know, what is it? Wheat, barley, oats, and rice. Be able to grow anywhere at no cost, any cost, you know, and over irrigation has caused huge areas of salinization in Australia, trying to grow the wrong things in the wrong place. Mm. But Aboriginal people, and I, I picked up a book earlier this week and it was from the central deserts and bushfire and bush tucker, an old book. And I counted over 250 food plants just listed in there and I sort of got tired of counting in the end, mm. you know, in desert country, you know. Um, you know. What are your thoughts on the over-dependence, well, I, I think the lack, the failure of Australia to realise the 
the nutrition and economic potential of its own food sources. Have you got any thoughts on, on that and, and some of the problems that are associated with that? Yeah, so I am very new to this realm, but it's something that I'm really passionate about, thinking about food sovereignty and what that might look like in the future, especially for our health and well-being as Aboriginal and or Torres Strait Islander peoples. One of the things that's really glaring to me about the ongoing effects of colonisation is if we look at foods. If I go into a supermarket today, there's probably only four or five things that I can buy that reflect the 65,000 plus years of people being incredibly healthy, vibrant, um, active mob all over the country. And it's the explorers, the explorers' journals that tell us how healthy people were. No one says that we were crawling around, um, you know, on death's door waiting for the superior race to arrive and, and help us out. And if you go into a supermarket, you'll be really lucky. If you go to a fancy one, you might get some brew meat a macadamia nut, a wattle seed, something or other, and some eucalyptus oil. And I just think that's such a glaring um, a glaring uh, example of um, the, the erasures of colonisation that continue today because all of the foods that we have eaten over the longest time imaginable right across the country are perfectly suited to this environment. There's no reliance on lots of water. There's no reliance on petrochemicals. They can't stand fertilisers. All the things that are ripping from country and really depleting all of our resources um, don't happen when you're actually looking at um, Indigenous foods and food crops. So I think the over-reliance is really scary. Um, I read something recently that I, I think said it was about 55% of, um, of the grain that we rely on for our staple foods is from, you know, European kind of um, agriculture. So with what's happening with the climate, that's really scary because a lot of these grains don't deal with climate fluctuations, which means we're going to have... Oh, oh we've lost Zena, so we'll uh, we'll pick up and I'm, I'm sure she'll pop back in. Oh, there we go. You're back. Here we go. Yeah, no, continue, continue on, please, Zena. ...in the future with climate fluctuations. But then you look at something like kangaroo grass and if you Google kangaroo grass and look at its distribution, it's incredible. It's all over the country, which means that it can grow in frost conditions or, you know, anything you can think of pretty much. If you look at that colour, it just goes everywhere. And, you know, we know that um, through archaeology that uh, Aboriginal people were the first bread makers. Again, did we learn that in school? Isn't it something that we should all be so proud of? There's... Um, one grinding stone that I know of that I'm probably behind now, there's probably more that have been found, but it was found in Cuddy Springs and I think it was dated at 36,000 years that they they could prove that um, the sediment on it was from kangaroo grass and it was being used to make bread. Um, so we're way before the Egyptians or anyone else. I just, yeah, the main thing for me is that uh, with what's happening with the climate, we are definitely going to have to start thinking about what grows on this country best, what grows without too much water, um, you know, is also really good for the environment in lots of other ways. I don't know a lot about it, but I've heard Uncle Bruce and others talking about our native grasses, um, you know, having the capacity to sequester carbon. Um, so I think that, you know, there's moves happening in this area, but there's still that assumed superiority that we, we have this problem with, where oftentimes um, I think people have tried to grow our native crops with a, an entirely European perspective and lens. So grown as monocultures, grown in the wrong place at the wrong time, um, not knowing how to harvest because they're not using any of our knowledge over a long period of time of how to get that grain in a way that makes it, um, you know, viable. Um, so I think that the more that we can drive and be a part of the reinvigorations of looking at our foods, the better everyone's going to be because Lots of elders know a, a lot about foods that hasn't been um, shared far and wide. And there's been a perception that, especially in the southeast, that our knowledge is dead or is lost. And I hear that a lot and I can't tell you how much my heart breaks when I hear of people who are really high up at universities who've told students that who want to concentrate on the southeast on food plants that they need to go up north to where the real Aboriginal people are. I hear this so often. And this creates a cycle where in the southeast and other places 
we are not properly resourced. So it makes it look like there's nothing there because people aren't finding anything. In the same way that it looked like we didn't have agriculture. People didn't know what lens to use to kind of to look at what we were doing, which is active management of country always. You don't get to be here this long in one of the harshest places in the world if you are not actively managing country. This was not a stumbling exercise of good luck. So, yeah, I'm kind of ranting now, but I think that things are going to change because the climate is changing in such a way that we're hitting crunch time. Yeah, no, I, you're spot on, Zena. And, you know, really, if we, we harken back, and this was just a part of the truth telling your town before, I don't think anyone's sitting there pointing the finger and saying, you know, we, we hate you. It's, a, it's basically recognising how we got here, you know, and mm -hmm. I think, you know, when Australia was invaded by the British, you had Darwin doing his theories of evolution, you had social Darwinism kicking off, and Aboriginal people in Australia, it's a fact, were considered the missing link between humans and apes, and probably more towards the apes. So there's no surprise that anything Aboriginal people were doing was not given any sort of agency or credence as, as a science or, or anything deliberate, and you can see this. You know, another book I picked up this week was a correspondence between Governor Arthur and, the, and His Majesty in Tasmania, and you know, the language and sorts of things that are in those texts are just mind boggling, it's just dehumanizing. So it's no surprise there. And I think the Bush Tucker lens is really interesting. And I've just done it there, Bush Tucker, you know, like our foods aren't given serious, you know, um, serious credit, you know, like there's no serious endeavor to harvest the economic and nutrition potential of our local grains, you know, like there's just sort of these boutique things. And it's only ever going to be boutique until, as you say, we're taken seriously and our knowledge is taken seriously uh, in this space. So I guess moving forward, if we think about how do we move forward from, you know, 250 years of problematic interactions from this, the instrumental role that science played in the dehumanization and and uh, uh, and sort of dis attempted disintegration, and it failed, it abjectly failed, attempted uh, disintegration of our culture. Because as you say, Zena, our culture is very vibrant and very alive, and it is not lost. In some cases, it needs some reawakening, or maybe you have to build trust for our mob to to tell you as a white person about our knowledge, given the the history. So there's, you know, that that relationship building that you're talking about. How do we how do we move forward from this point? Because we're all here, we're all, all positive individuals looking for solutions. So, what are you, what are some thoughts, maybe, Brad, on on how do we move forward in either the water space or any space, really? Yeah, look, I, I think we we don't really have anything to hang our hat on um, as as you know as, as scientists, but also as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. You know, when you look at the National Science Strategy um, of 2017, you know, it sort of suggests that Indigenous people should do STEM like women, that's it. You know, so that's that's what we've got to hang on. We don't have a centre of excellence. We don't have, you know, we're, there are um, Indigenous people starting to appear in the research space and, you know, that, that, that's been fantastic to watch. But I think this, the aspect that we need that centre of excellence to, to, to allow our people to do our science our way. And I think the other thing is in that way we can move as you know that previous conversation talking about where we've come from you know that we were perceived as you know speaking myth and legend and mumbo jumbo and fables and you know that puts that in the realm of fiction not science so you know that's the that's what happened from day one um and so when we look at day one we might need once we get our center of excellence national indigenous science strategy we can come up with a 232-year 230 year recovery plan for this continent and we'd, we'd be the drivers. That's a way forward. Yeah, I'm with you. Sign me up. <laughs> you got any uh, ideas, Lena, in, in this space on how do we move forward? Uh, look, I completely agree with Brad and I see so much goodwill um, from um you know, the whole community, everyone really wants to make this happen. But I think sometimes we get pipped at the post because we're all kind of working in institutional contexts in some ways and institutions aren't particularly friendly um, to our mob because uh, when you constantly um, have the your worldview uh, undermined, it's, it's really problematic and difficult to stay with it. 
Um, and so I think that what Brad's talking about um, in terms of having our own spaces where we can be together and feed off each other and have, um, you know, that support around us is an excellent idea. Um, Michael, you and I have spoken quite a few times about what we think could work at the University of Melbourne where we work. And one thing that I'm really excited about in our conversations is the idea that um, in some ways we might be able to make our workplace at the university look a little bit more like an Aboriginal community where we have elders who support us and mentor us and then, you know, um, other people kind of in the middle but also bringing up our young people through these systems that are often really difficult to um, to be in, um, I think, because I guess one of the biggest problems is and one thing I really dislike about um, my job is I'm often the only Aboriginal person in the room and that's not only culturally inappropriate because I'm not a knowledge holder, I would be considered less than a toddler on my country in terms of what I know and I accept that. I just do the best I can to be learning all the time. That's all I can do. But being the only Aboriginal person in the room is problematic on a number of fronts and it's especially problematic when you feel under siege and you need someone to talk to um, who can see what's happening um, to be able to get through it. So I think the more ways that we can make space for us um, to come into these um, these places, the better. But we also need to, in lots of ways, not just make space, but to think about, um, I guess, making it a place that people want to stay. Because I think every university in Australia, from, from the papers that I've read, has got a retention problem. And a retention problem is a culture problem. And for me, that starts with education. I've been really shocked when I when I started at the university. I'd worked at universities for a long time as a research assistant, but I hadn't been exposed to so many people on such a high level as what I am now. And I have to say that whilst many people have gone a long way in trying to educate themselves about um, Aboriginal and or Torres Strait Islander people's challenges in this in this realm, I think there's also a lot of ignorance. Because when people are incredibly smart and incredibly good at something, it sometimes means that if there's something that they don't quite get, they won't um, they won't approach it with their eyes open. They'll kind of almost say to themselves that it's not there or it's someone else's problem because they're so used to excelling. And we've got that culture problem in academia in lots of ways. Someone has to be the best. Someone has to be at the top. Someone has to be the expert. That's very unfriendly to Aboriginal and or Torres Strait Islander people's ways of knowing and it also doesn't create a culture where people are on their best behavior a lot of the time so we've still got a lot of researchers and people doing the wrong thing not only by aboriginal people at at the in the institution but by the the communities that they're um they're endeavoring to work with so i don't want to sound like i'm really down on everything but i think we've got a long way to go and i think that a lot of the time Places which are very prestigious really worry about optics and they should be worrying about relationships. Sometimes you can't see a relationship forming, but it's real and it'll be there forever. Optics are just window dressing. Yeah, it's a great point. I think, and you know, the one thing that can change that culture is just getting more of us mob into the system. You know, I think that, you know, in thinking about, you know, and Zena and I, as you've said, we've talked a lot about this and we've even talked about a Blackfellow University, really, like, and there's the aspiration. That's that's the end point of your centre of excellence, Brad. And I, I think that, you know, these are public institutions that we're working in. They're, they're designed to benefit society. You know, we are all essentially public servants from the academy right through to these universities. And to do that effectively, we need to reflect the composition of society. We need to reflect what's going out there. And if we say, for example, in the Science Faculty of the University of Melbourne are well, well, well below the mix of, of staff, and this is not just University of Melbourne, right across the country, across the academy, right across uh, the country, we are well below a mix that is reflective of the broader society uh, in, in terms of uh, the number of Aboriginal people doing work. And then that is usually biased towards Aboriginal people who are in, in fixed term positions, tenuous employment, lower down in the vertical structure of an institution. So there's a real need to make meaningful progress in engaging. And one thing I, I think from, from my mind that help us in our way forward, and we've talked about, you know, we've talked about 68,000, 65,000, whatever, it's just a number, it's, it's old, really, really old. It's more than 3,000 generations of people 
more than 3,000 generations of encoded hardwired knowledge on how to live in this country through some of the biggest changes in environment, climatic and all these sorts of things that the world has experienced. You know, it's huge, huge changes, or at least uh, humans have experienced in this in this country. Um, we need to start recognising other qualifications of knowledge, I think, and bringing people in who, you know, the academy sets the rules. Essentially, it's a, it's a club where you set the rules and you decide who comes in and who doesn't. And in a situation where, you know, there's not equal access for everybody to education and the opportunity to get into university and then succeed, and Zena's already touched on the attrition rates, Aboriginal students are at least twice as likely to withdraw from subjects. They're infinitely less likely to even enrol in university in the first place. And they're half as likely to turn their undergraduate degree into a postgraduate degree and do some research in the science space. So you know, we're losing people all the way through. There's no real surprise when you set the bar in, in these institutions as having have to have a PhD or something like this and not recognising the wealth of knowledge that sits in people like Uncle Badger, yeah. people like Uncle Dave Wandon, people, yeah. you know, all these people that we know who, you know, I've got a PhD, I'm sitting here operating this space, but I don't know a fraction of what, what they do, you know, about country and, and the way that, that things work. So I think broadening the horizons on what a knowledge holder constitutes can really help in that endeavour, I think, Zena, as, as, a, as a way forward. Mm -hmm. So I guess to sort of where, bearing in mind time and maybe people have questions, I think we've touched on a few things here and without once again um, trying to labour the point of, because I feel very, very privileged to be able to serve society. I feel very privileged to be a scientist. I feel very privileged to be able to uh, make my culture come through my scientific work and, uh, and really help in the endeavour to reassert Indigenous knowledge into society. But there are certain things that come along with being a black academic, an academic in, in a, an Aboriginal academic. Um, for one, and I think it's, it's really incumbent upon us maybe just to, to share some of our stories. The one that gets me, you know, that I face a lot uh, is the appropriateness of asking me to speak for other people's country or other people's things. You know, like quite often we're just uh, uh, a tick box, I think you call it, Brad, or something like that, you know, like we're just there to tick the box and, well, you know, we want to do this and it's on Jaja, we're on country, we've got Michael, he's Aboriginal, I'm Radri, you know, like I can advise you maybe the right way to go about engaging, but you need to do the work to, so uh, quite often I think that is missed and forgotten and I think that's essentially that's tokenism, you know, so it'd be really good if our scientific brothers and sisters, our colleagues out there would understand that. And I guess that disappears a little bit when there's more of us in the institution um, and there's more of that knowledge. What are your guys' experiences about being a, an Aboriginal person in a, in a very white institution, uh, an academic institution? Maybe, Brad? Yeah, look, uh, no doubt it sometimes feels like a ticker box, but, you know, you, you say yes because you, you're asked and then you think if I don't say it, no one will say it, or if... I don't say it, someone else will say it and they'll say it wrong. And But then you need to have that disclaimer that you, you aren't talking for that country, you know, that as you mentioned, Michael, you know, that, you know, I've been on a number of committees and, you know, that aspect that, oh, you're Indigenous, you, you've ticked that box, you're on that committee, but I will only represent, you know, Kamilori country, that's it. I can't represent everyone else. I will never put myself in a position to be a voice for Aboriginal Australia and Torres Strait Islanders. No way in the world. You know, I've, I've got one place in the country that I connect to and, you know, through through my knowledge holders and elders, I can only talk if I'm allowed to. Um, and that, that's the other thing is that, you know, that, that aspect of being the only one, you know, you, you touched on, you become the black inbox. Everything that has the Indigenous title or, or challenge that the university or the organisation is facing will find its way into your inbox. And you, can, you, you, can't, you don't have the answers to all those, uh, those challenges. They're, they're massive, you know, sometimes they're legal, sometimes they're human resources issues, sometimes they're personal issues and you, you've got no chance. And you know that, and while you're doing all this, you've got to try and maintain your own cultural integrity. And, you know, that's a real challenge is that you've got to come out the other side without damaging that. And, you know, there are some of our mob that, that, that go through that, that, that I suppose, go through that door and their, their integrity is damaged. And, you know, you know what it's like through the Murray, Koori, Guri 
Noongar, grapevine, that word travels super fast. Mm-hmm. You know, that's faster than the NBN, that stuff. Um, <laughs> even though it's not that fast. <laughs> but, um, you know, that, that, sort of, that sort of bad information travels so fast. And, you know, your, your time in Aboriginal affairs could be over before, it, you know, before, you, before you're getting into it. And, um, and I think the aspect of mentors, you know, we, you know we, us being, you know, paving the way for so long, we the mentors we we're looking for mentors but the mentee beca- has to become the mentor straight away you know you have to flip and you know obviously there's the, the next generation that want to access your your time and knowledge and you know i i, I love that and it's, it's an honor to be um thought of that way but i think the challenge is we also with the lack of mentors we, we struggle with the lack of a, a, a scientific network and you know that's my next big journey or challenge that i'll that i'll do um in you know it's pretty much in my own time but it's you know it's it's just having that next generation they i don't want them to miss out and you know as you, you talked about that attrition rate um and the the you know more girls start stem than boys more boys finish stem but there's a huge dropout rate why is that we need to get to the bottom of that and we need to get them supported and you know wanting to learn science wanting to ask those questions and wanting to do research to answer those questions for themselves from an Indigenous methodology, you know, and, and I think that's that's my hope for the future anyway, is that we can influence that way. Yeah, great point. What about you, Zena? A, a message about what it's like being... sometimes I feel <clears throat> like I'm being mined. So um, just even, you know, people from outside of my workplace, which is a very respectful place at the university, will contact me and be wanting all these things um, and for me to head up projects and all sorts of things. And it's really inappropriate. And I, um, with along with that resource to be mined, I also see that people want all of these amazing things to happen without resourcing them also. So I've had people come to me and say, oh, can you lead this project? We want to talk about Wadanjeri seasons on the Parkfield campus and we want elders to be involved and we want young people to know this information about Wadanjeri seasons and to realise where they are. And I'm like, oh, yeah, that sounds really cool. Um, you know, what's your budget? Oh, we've, we've got photocopying budget. And you just think, how could I get elders to be involved in this? Like this is not putting food on the table. But, yeah, I just think you know, realising that we can do so much but it has to be resourced and also realising that when you get um, mob in to positions, you need to leave them to do what they need to do and not think of them as a resource for you to tick all of the aspects of what you need to get done, done. Because I know for a fact that I'm doing two or three jobs at any one time. I'm never just doing my research job. And almost all Aboriginal people I know talk about the same thing. The, the burden of the extra work. But if someone asked me to go and talk to young people who are coming to the uni and there's a huge Aboriginal mob in there, I'm not going to say no. But I get really sick of never being offered to be paid as well. You know, it's a lot. It takes time away from my family. It often happens after hours. I just think we all need to think about resourcing a bit more because we're running Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people ragged. And money's yeah. not everything. But I would like to have a nicer holiday for all the time I get away from my kids. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a really great point, Zena. You know, but I think for when the reconciliation action, no, the reconciliation act is, you know, more than a, a decade, probably two decades old now. You know, and and there hasn't been much movement in some institutions like this. So we've got to get serious and start putting a money where the mouth is and and affecting some change. But, there's a whole lot there. There's about the pathways into university. There's about making us a place that mob will want to come to, all these sorts of things wrapped up in it. It's a, it's a pretty 
complex net of uh, issues that are, you know, but that they're challenges. And everyone, I think I love a challenge, and I think that's you know every bit we can do, we can we can make a difference. And I think that you know you you two are, are shining examples for our mob. You know, like a, people can look up to to people like you and and other Indigenous academics who are doing such amazing work and and aspire to that. And I think that you can't undersell the importance of your role in community like that. So I think it's uh, it's really amazing. Now it's we've only got a few minutes left, so I thought I'd um, could continue on forever, really. But um, <laughs> I thought I'd sort of segue into a few of the questions. We've got a whole bunch of questions that um, we've been asked. And one for you, in particular, Zena, how might connection to country be improved in urban environments when native biodiversity continues to be threatened by urban development? Question, but I kind of see that um, we can't all be Aboriginal and or Torres Strait Islander people, but we can all embrace our role as custodians of country. And I do a bit of work with young people and that's one thing that is, I guess, my key message is that we all have responsibility. And even the small things that we can do in our own yards in an urban environment are going to help all of the animals, of which there are many threatened species that live in cities especially. Um, there's so many things that we can each do to make a difference in our own backyards. So, for example, the more that I'm learning, I'm now not planting my garden, thinking about my family and what we're going to eat entirely. I'm more thinking from my Aboriginal perspective of, like, how am I looking after all the animals in my little yard, all the insects that need um, to be here so that the birds have got something to eat, so the lizards have got something to eat, et cetera, et cetera. So I think in terms of urban environments, we've very much been wiped out um, of the visage, so you can't really see um, Aboriginal people's um, belonging in these places. But there is no place in Australia that does not have one traditional owner group or more, whether it's urban or out in the bush, that doesn't speak for it. Like everywhere has someone speaking for it and everywhere has Aboriginal um, people and up the top Torres Strait Islander people who know that country. And so any way that we can connect with the mobs um, on whose country we're on in a respectful way is a really great way, I think, of um, of promoting caring for country in urban environments. And, you know, we're really lucky in Melbourne. We've got, um, you know, traditional owner groups who are really strong and who have people within them who are amazing at sharing narratives. Um, so I think there's a wealth of information out there for people and there's also a, a huge amount that we can do um, in our own um, lives and in our own places where we live and work that can um, really help support biodiversity. And I guess my plant booklet was only a little tiny thing, but I made it because I saw so many people, especially in schools and kinder groups, wanting to make Indigenous gardens but not thinking about all of the animals that they were also helping and also, I guess, the Aboriginal perspective of those plants and, and the door that it opens in terms of understanding the deep knowledge that goes with understanding so many uses for our plants. So, yeah, I think it can be difficult in an urban environment. A lot of people don't even realise they're on Aboriginal country when they're in an urban environment, but people are waking up a bit more and, and there's lots we can do in that area to kind of educate ourselves because we've got mobs that are, that are telling their stories really powerfully. Yeah, great, great answers. And it makes me think, you know, there are dreaming stories out there and songlines out there that from mob that have invasive animals in them. You know, like uh, there's, we have to also think about what we mean by biodiversity and and healthy country and all of this sort of stuff. There's this, I think that one of the barriers to um, getting people managing country is this myth that it's a landscape to museums or you've got to go back to a certain state. You know, if there's one thing about all humanity, all humans, is that we adapted dingoes three and a half thousand years ago whatever it is you know like things have been introduced and they're they're incorporated into the system so i think there's a for my mind we need to, to base ourselves of what we think is kind of um healthy land in terms of oh no there's a there's a weed in there therefore there's no hope for it you know like i think that we can we can shift our ideas around and and you can get native plants um foods other important species in to a mix where there are some non-native plants as well. And I think that 
we need to move forward. I think that's one of the barriers or one of the things that we spend a lot of money on in this country wasting time for. There's some really harmful pests and things like that. But this notion that we can somehow control the the world around us to such an nth degree that we can we can mitigate these sorts of things. Slight tangent, but um, okay. So there's a good one here for you, Brad, and it sort of touches on a bit. I'll, I'll read it verbatim, although I challenge that that um, loss of knowledge is not the right word, perhaps. But I get the point. As an Aboriginal man working in the water industry, I have the following question: In working with traditional custodians about what they would like to see on their own country. There is a loss of knowledge and a lack of people within their organisations to be able to provide this information. How do we support them or encourage young people to get into this field so we understand the colonisers' policies while incorporating our cultural knowledge into the management of this land and avoid missing the opportunities where Aboriginal people can have a stay? It's a long one. Oh, that's huge. <laughs> that was like <laughs> Zena's question. We've got another hour? <laughs> yeah, yeah, we've got another hour. Yeah, look, it's, I suppose it's one thing is we need to see Indigenous people leading and telling their stories about water in that space. You know, if we're not telling it, then it's not being heard and or, as I mentioned earlier, someone else is telling it for us. So I suppose we need our, we need our heroes to be telling our water stories, you know, and that, that's that aspect we talked earlier about of our traditional, um, traditional knowledge holders and our elders talking in, in these forums as well, you know, that they need to be to their telling their stories about water. And I think it's it's about how we teach water as well. So the, the curricula needs to change about how we celebrate Indigenous knowledge in water. That's missing. And I think um, obviously we don't have that mechanism around research or, or um, you know, a, 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 an Indigenous professional society in the water space, you know. So there's there's all these different societies. Like I think I'm a member of about six societies at the moment. And, you know, they all range from groundwater to surface water to ecology. And I think it's, I'm just trying to get the best out of each one. But the challenge is I'm drawn to a lot of them to talk. And I think we need more people um, in that space. And, you know, we need the next generation putting their hand up as well. Um, and if that lad talks about the loss of knowledge or lass, I don't, you know, whoever it was, you know, that's a that's a challenge for us. You know, a lot of our stories are still in the landscape. We just got to go out and listen to them. You know, we've got to have that time as as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people to go out on country, connect with country, sit down and do science our way and understand country the way it was. You know, to try and reconnect with our country. You know, and I think that's the thing. Like I'm. I'm working on my country at the moment in the Guaida wetlands. It's a Ramsar site, but for the last 200 years, it's been in private land ownership. So we haven't had access to our own country. You know, so we're starting to, to regain access. And, you know, I think that aspect of if we get access to our country, you know, we start having a say in the way we manage country, we'll start seeing the benefits. And we're already seeing that with threatened species. We're seeing that with caring for country and working on country. Um, the ranger groups, you know, next I'd love to see river rangers. You know, that's our next, that's on my, next on my hit list with the 232-year uh, recovery plan and the Centre of Excellence. <laughs> Long list. <laughs> yeah, no, that, that's great. Um, so we're going to wrap up. There's just a small question here um, on, and I'll, I'll have a crack at this, Zena, give your voice a break if you like. Um, irrigation has happened all over the world, not just Australia, and it's been impacting environments everywhere. What is the solution from a point of view of Indigenous knowledge? I think the, the overall point is that I don't think we should or it's appropriate to completely abandon these big four grains, you know, like we, we need food. We need to produce uh, high quantity food. But I'll draw an example for this thing called Goida's Line for those who know in South Australia. And, and it was a line drawn across by what? scientist, a geographer probably, they tend to do all the coolest stuff. Um, the, that if you planted above or you decided to move some kind of agricultural industry above this line in South Australia, north of this line, you would eventually be hit by drought. You would fail. You know, he said, uh, he said there's a safe, safe operating space to operate below. But above this line, you know, there are reports of mob growing grains, living healthy lives, having a really productive life on traditional foods, you know. So it's about a mix. It's not about, and this is, I think, really is reflective of 
of kind of, uh, and I'm not having a go at the question here, but this simple simple notion that society's hooked on is single fixes, you know, desalinization plants or nuclear power plants rather than diversified, you know, and we know that diversity promotes resilience. If changes come, if you're more diverse, you're gonna be able to withstand that. So it's not about completely uprooting every single wheat, barley, oat plant in the country. It's about planting the appropriate things in the right country. You know, in places like that above Goiter's line, there are there are native grains out there. Let's work on those. Let's improve those. Let's do whatever we can for those. Let's get the right planting. Let's understand their ecology. Let's do all these sorts of things and turn that into productive land and, and productive country, I think is more the point. It's not necessarily about just overturning existing agriculture and whacking in a bunch of native foods. It's about, it's about the appropriate mix on country. Mm. All right, so we're kind of out. Sorry, I took over that one, Zena, but I, I feel a little bit passionate about that one. No, I'm glad. Uh, yeah. So I really, really want to thank you too. I feel really privileged to have been able to talk to you. You know, I, I admire you both greatly from afar and Zena from a bit less afar. And even though it's been COVID, with, there's been no face-to-face -face for, for a long time. Um, so I'd like to thank you. I think it's been a stimulating conversation. I'd like to thank everyone listening for um, the wonderful questions and for for listening to us have a yarn. And I hope that uh, you've taken something from it. I certainly have. I've learned a bit off you two through this conversation. And um, yeah, here's to moving forward in a place, in a society where Indigenous knowledge is recognised as science. I would like to flag that there's another sort of sister event, cousin event, whatever you want to call it, um, on the skies um, on Thursday from the Academy of Sciences. So please go along there and see another three really excellent Indigenous science, scientists talk about uh, sky and the stars uh, as a part of this um, dual um, offering from the Academy of Sciences. So thank you to the Academy of Sciences. Thank you, Brad and Zena, and thank you, everyone, for watching. Thank Thanks you. Very cool. Thanks yeah. for having me. Yeah. Good night.